Well, welcome uh, to this episode of uh, eighth grade social studies, Mr. Mendoza's class, the best class, the best social studies class. Uh, this is going to be over chapter 14. Uh, we talked about this on Monday and Tuesday, the 10th and 11th. So if you missed either of those days or you want to uh, uh, rewind and just kind of review uh, these lessons, this is what this is for. Uh, I, uh, I have to go back and record a couple of uh, lessons that I missed, so I apologize for not posting in a while. Um, things just kind of got a little crazy there for a few weeks, trying to get everything situated after the star and before the star. But now we are back on track, and you should be getting these lessons pretty regularly from here until the end of the year. Uh, we are in a little bit of faster pace, just trying to get everything in so that we can do a really good solid review for the star. But, uh, but today, again, we're going to do uh, the lesson for chapter 14. So what I've been doing is having you guys take a little slip of paper with the bell work on it. Uh, today's bell work is this. In your opinion, was Andrew Jackson a hero or a zero? Explain your answer. If you remember back from last time, we had Andrew Jackson. We put him on trial. We looked at the good. We looked at the bad. We looked at all the stuff in between and discussed if Andrew Jackson was a hero or a zero. Was he deserving of recognition or was he someone who was uh, not, a, not a good person? But, uh, but yeah, definitely go ahead and take a minute and jot that down on a piece of paper. Pause the video and turn it in when you get back to class if this is someone that, if you're someone who did not attend class because I need that grade in the grade book. So you can go ahead and pause it now. Okay. Um, hopefully you, you paused it and did what you needed to do, but we're going to go ahead and move on. Now again, today is chapter 14. Uh, you'll need to get the vocabulary builder if you missed today, as well as the graphic, uh, not the graphic organizer, it's, not, it's actually a typo, but the graphic novel that, uh, uh, that was your assignment for homework, your graphic novel plus the questions that go along with it. So those are handouts that you'd need to get from me if you missed, and make sure that you again have that for the gradebook. Okay, manifest destiny. Manifest destiny. Um, this is a concept that is, uh, you know, always a popular one. I always hear kids talking, when are we going to talk about manifest destiny? Well, this is it. <laughs> okay. I don't know why it's so fascinating, but people don't want to, uh, I guess, see how we got from one end of the, uh, one end of the continent to the other, from one coast to the other. Uh, we will, by the way, talk about the, at least the, the picture with the woman kind of floating and levitating. We'll talk about that. Um, and, and talk about, you know, what the symbolism or what, uh, what the meaning of that picture is, uh, hopefully. So here we go. Okay, uh, first thing we're going to talk about is Marcus and Narcissa Whitman. Uh, these two are, are really, they're missionaries that went to the Cayusa Indians near Walla Walla, Washington. Uh, this is kind of their mission, their calling to go out into the wilderness and to minister to them and try to get them converted to Christianity. Also to provide, you know, necessary medical care to them. Uh, this was in the Oregon Territory. So this is up in the northwest quadrant of the United States, of what we'd call today the United States. Uh, you can see the pictures there, the uh, what we had as far as pictures of this couple and what the uh, particular Native Americans would have looked like and dressed like you know, back in the 1800s. Now, unfortunately, when they went there, they didn't bring as much medical care, medical care as they did disease. So it killed many of the children, many of the, uh, the people that were there, and the Native Americans. They blamed Marcus and Narcissa Whitman for their deaths. So what they did was they killed the Whitmans and 11 other people in the mission, leaving him, uh, you know, leaving kind of a massacre in their wake. So not, not a pleasant thing, but something that did happen, just kind of a noteworthy thing that I want to make sure you guys were aware of, that, uh, that even as they're moving westward, they're still spreading diseases. There's still a, a danger from this out there. But how did they get there? Well, we see the use of a trail uh, leading out to Oregon, to the Oregon Territory from the known territory out there in Missouri. This is known as the Oregon Trail, the Oregon Trail. 
Despite several violent events and stories, people still emigrated from the United States. Now, that word emigrated, if you are exiting, right, exit and emigrate, both start with an E. If you are emigrating, that means you are leaving, you're exiting a country. If you're immigrating, you're coming in. In and immigrate both start with an I. So it's a good, good little trick to memorize that, to remember it. But emigrate means to leave. Immigrate means to come in. So an immigrant is someone who came into this country. An emigrant is someone who left your country. And so these people are leaving their country, going into another country uh, or another territory, another unknown territory, leaving the the, the uh the United States to Oregon. Because remember, Oregon isn't a state at this time. It's not part of the United States. It's just a territory. And thousands of other settlers loaded up their what's called prairie schooners, and they, they went out, you know, horse-drawn carriages, uh, like you see there in the picture. And they're called prairie schooners. The reason is because uh, a schooner really historically was a, a, a boat, right, out on the water, this boat called a schooner. Well, these, when they were out there being pulled by the horses, they looked like these boats out in the water. So again, called prairie schooners. But they caravaned west. I mean, they were all lined up one after another after another. So for a mile, you know, just a mile down the road, you would see these caravan, this caravan of prairie schooners all lined up in a, in a single file line, all coming following the same trail. And, and that's what a caravan would be. This is what a, a prairie schooner would have looked like. You can even notice the difference between the top picture and the bottom picture that, that's a little bit different. And that's because, honestly, they got better at making these for the trip. There was a, a journey that they needed to take, and this journey couldn't just take any old covered wagon. Uh, it, it, they needed to invent some wagons that were a little bit more suited for the environment. And so these were. Uh, they had a, a curved bottom. You can kind of see that. It's kind of sloped, and that's so that all the cargo would kind of gravitate towards the middle and not roll everywhere and cause it to be imbalanced. Uh, the tires aren't the same size, or the wheels aren't the same size in the front and the back. Again, making it a little bit better suited for the terrain and the environment to get through these. Okay. Now, this picture. This painting is titled American Progress. Uh, it was painted in 1872 by John Gast. This represents the United States, that woman there flying. She represents the United States, represents liberty and freedom and all that that implies. And she is almost leading the way westward. Uh, and, and in the picture, if you can look closely enough, there's a couple trains in the far, far distance beyond the second train. You can see boats in the harbor or, or boats in the river traveling westward as well. So the trains are going west. The boats are going west. The schooners are going west. The horses are going west. Uh, you see the, the cattle, the, the one guy there uh, just by her knee uh, is, is riding a horse. And it looks like he's running, running towards the buffalo. And they're going, everybody's going west. Uh, being driven or led by, by destiny. And even, I want to point out this symbolism, uh, look, at, look in front of her. Look in front of her in the sky. Look how dark that is. Look how, uh, like a storm. But look behind her. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. See, she brings with her the light and the beauty and the good things. And she's going into the darkness to bring that light. See, that's this imagery of of the of what would have happened. Now this this is painted after the Civil War. So so Manifest Destiny has really kind of been around for a while. This isn't like propaganda, but this is looking back at it, picturing what people were seeing Manifest Destiny as uh, bringing the light to the to the world, particularly there in the West. Okay, there are really two mentalities of of the the United States and the Americans and even explorers coming over. In the 1600s and 1700s, the national mission was to be the model, the model of freedom and democracy. Okay, we, we wanted to be this beacon of hope and light. But then after 1800, that changed a little bit. Now, instead of being this model of democracy, we felt like we were going to spread this freedom by going and settling the entire continent. We wanted the entire continent to be our home. This concept became known as Manifest Destiny. Okay. As a matter of fact, uh, people in the United States, they felt like we were destined by God. God had called us 
to go and to claim the land from coast to coast. This concept of extending our borders and our boundaries from coast to coast, from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean, was known as Manifest Destiny. And a lot of people bought into it. Leaders, regular people, a lot of people thought, yeah, this is the deal. Okay, the election of 1844. This was where uh, the Democratic candidate, James K. Polk, is coming in and running for office, and he's a big supporter of Manifest Destiny. A big supporter. And at this time, just like this picture here would suggest, there's a, a, a slogan that comes out, 54-40 or fight. 50, and this 54-40 or fight, um, this is really, um, really it's about this line of, of, of latitude that, this line of latitude, sorry, there's a little glitch there, but uh, this line of latitude that um, extended above into the Canadian territory. So it's this line, and you can see it a little bit better on this next slide. Uh, it's this line above the, the regular 49 degrees that we would know today as the border of the U.S. and Canada. And they were really wanting that, that line to be moving up to 54 degrees, 40 minutes north latitude. But of course that belonged to the British, so we have to get them to buy off on it. But it's where we wanted this Oregon territory to end. Well, Despite that, Britain said no, and in 1846, we officially established that the 49 degrees that had presently been the border would remain the border permanently. So we did not get it, and Polk ended up winning the election. And it was under Polk's direction and, and political leadership that that got established, that that got established. All right, so Florida State... Um, not the college, but Florida itself, became a state March 3rd, 1845. Uh, this just is setting the stage a little bit for what we're about to talk about. Uh, another thing that happened during this time period in 1821, Mexico won its independence from Spain. Uh, this really gave a huge part of, um, of North America to Mexico, where Mexico basically would own a lot of that land in North America south of the United States including the western part of, the, of what today we would call the United States, and excluded Spain. So Mexico now is the person that we're dealing with, not Spain, but we're dealing with Mexico when we're trying to acquire these new lands. Now this individual right here, this is uh, General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. Uh, he is the general uh, during the war for Texas that comes in and brings his troops. Uh, there's different pictures here because, you know, you can see the different aspects. You have him as a young man, him as an old man, and then you have a painting which even looks a little bit different. And although Mexico is trying to uh, encourage settlers, what happens is settlers are, are encouraged to come over. They're wanting settlers. And it's, it's really not much that they're asking, but it's a little much for the people that they're asking. Uh, they say, you know, you have to swear allegiance to the U.S. or to me, uh, swear allegiance to Mexico, not the U.S., you have to become a Catholic, and you have to uh, follow basically all of their laws and everything and stay there for at least 10 years. So all this is what they're asking. Well, the, the, the settlers that are coming don't really want to do this, so they don't. And because they don't, the Mexicans get mad. Settlers, the, the Texans get mad back. So you have this battle between the both of them. So in 1835, General Santa Ana took his troops, into Texas to fight this rebellion and begins the war for Texas independence. Um, everybody has at least heard of the Alamo, or most everybody should have heard of the Alamo. Uh, many of these battles were fought around missions um, just because they were the most fortified thing probably in the town. Uh, but the most famous of these was the Alamo. Okay, the Alamo. And the Alamo battle lasted for 13 days. Very few people survived, and in the end, the Texans were defeated at the Alamo. But what it did was it really um, motivated the future battles, inspiring them to victory and giving them hope, 
giving them hope. All right, in class, we watched a video about the Alamo. You can feel free to look on YouTube, find a video about the Alamo, so you can learn a little bit more about it if that uh, is something you still need clarification about. Otherwise, we're gonna go ahead and move on. Um, afterwards, we discussed how did the battle of the Alamo affect the rest of the war, and we talked that through. But again, it's, it's something that we, we looked at in the video. Now the, the state of Texas is its own state, which is great. Hey, it's its own state. Everything is, is going well, but they don't want to be their own state. In 1836, Mexico signed the peace treaty with the Texans, creating the Lone Star Republic, okay, at first. And they elected Sam Houston as the president of this new country. But they kept asking the U.S., please, please let us come and join the U.S. The U.S. said no. Twice they did this. They asked the United States to annex uh, Texas or take control of Texas, but they didn't do that. Uh, finally, it took the election of a new president, uh, President Polk, to come in and, you know, he's, as we said before, he's a big supporter of Manifest Destiny, and he's like, well, this this area, this territory wants to become a state. Let's make it a state. Let's take over this area. So in 1845, Texas was annexed by the United States and became an official state. And you'll see there on the screen, the state seal of Texas and the five, or excuse me, the six flags, six flags, uh, six flags of the countries who have been in control of that land over the years. Uh, and that's where we get six flags over Texas because six flags have flown over Texas in its history. Uh, and, and you'll see those flags there. All right. Now, we're coming to a point where it's, it's not enough. You know, we have this insatiable appetite for new land, new territory. And this new president who just added uh, Texas now wants more. He wants California. He wants the area of New Mexico, these territories. And these territories are bigger than they, than they are today. It's not just limited to the states we know today. They were much bigger then, just like the, the area of Texas was much bigger back then. Uh, but they're in Mexican control, Mexican control. And Mexico doesn't want to sell. We try to buy it. They don't want to sell. And so Polk knew that the only way he was going to get it is to go to war. But he didn't want to make it look like the U.S. was starting a war for no reason. He wanted the U.S. Uh, population behind him. He wanted to get the support of the American people. And so he's got to make it look like it's Mexico's fault. But how to do it? How to do it? So first he tried to offer them money. He said, I'm going to give you $30 million for this land. But Mexico said, nope, not going to do it. Um, and also Mexico added in, you know, hey, I want Texas back while you're at it. Uh, you know, you can expect that conversation to happen in the near future. So Polk said, I think I have an idea of how this is going to work. And he sent Zachary Taylor, um, General Zachary Taylor, actually a future U.S. president, uh, to this disputed area. If you look back at, let me look back at this land. You can see this, this land here in the stripes. That's a disputed area. So half of Texas is disputed between who owns it, the Mexicans or the Americans. So then, as President Polk comes in, he says, uh, let me go back here. Yeah, he says, you know, hey, I'm going to send my troops into there. Just go there, chill out there, and, and wait for something to happen. And so the Mexicans saw that they were in the area that they said, this is ours. So they thought it was, they were on their land, because in their opinion, that's what it was, and began to attack. So now Polk has what he wants. He has the war that he knows he'll be able to win to get California and New Mexico. And here's his plan. He says, I'm going to drive the Mexicans out of this area of Texas, this disputed territory. I'm going to take over California and New Mexico. We're going to send our troops in there. And our forces are going to capture Mexico City. That three-pronged approach, that's what we're going to do. And by 1847, it had succeeded. Uh, they had taken over the disputed territory of Texas, they had taken California and New Mexico, and troops landed in Veracruz, Mexico, marched into Mexico City, and took it. So we now have control of Mexico City. So now we can make our demands, and we sign the peace treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, 
the U.S. takes over the area that today we know as California, Utah, Nevada, most of Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Wyoming, just all this land, now, to, now the United States owns it, and pretty much, a few exceptions, or pretty much we're seeing the full United States finally taking shape. We also agree to pay Mexico $15 million in reparations and uh, or restitution for you know damages and whatnot. We say, hey, listen, we're not going to just take the land. We are going to give you um, some money for it so that you know it's all official, and you don't come back later saying we stole it. We didn't steal it. We bought it from you. Although we did it by force, we still did it. Uh, hey guys, that's the way the the government does stuff, right? You know, we <laughs> the p national politics has to happen in a certain way. So anyway, we also take uh, take over $3.5 million in debt that Mexico owed to American citizens. We went ahead and said, we'll, we'll pay off that debt. Now, it sounds like a lot of money, but if you consider that we were going to pay $30 million, we actually got off with a pretty good deal, <laughs> uh, which was really nice. And here you can see a map. Uh, you can pause it if you want to take a better look at it. But here's a map of what lands we acquired and when we acquired them. All right. Uh, we also watched a video... And we're going to pass by that we also a video about this war, but it's just a recap of everything we watched. Um, you know, it's, it's a subjective question of whether or not we were justified. Uh, think about it. Think about whether you feel we were justified or not. Have an opinion on it. Okay, let's talk about football. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, this helmet, if you're not familiar, this is the helmet of the San Francisco 49ers. And that's obviously San Francisco's in California. Well, how did they get to be called the 49ers? That doesn't sound like something menacing. It's not the Jaguars or um, the Eagles or the Lions or anything. I mean, this is uh, 49ers. It sounds kind of a weird name for a football team. And why is their color even gold? Why is that helmet gold? Well, let's find out. The California Gold Rush. 1848. Gold was discovered in California at a place called Sutter's Mill. Uh, this guy was building a mill for, for this other guy. Uh, and he discovered gold in the water. And they were like, oh my gosh, there's gold here. Well, it didn't take very long for people to start flooding in. And in 1849, the next year, uh, these people started coming over. Because these people came over in 1849, they were known as the 49ers. Okay, because 1849... 49ers, and that's that's what they became nicknamed as, and that's where the 49ers get their name because of the impact that the 49ers had on the California area there, uh, the California state, as we know it today. Now, most of these people were Americans, but you know, some 20% of them came from as far away as Australia, as Europe, and Britain, and California, and Mexico, all, or or. Uh, Canada and Mexico. So these people were coming from all over the world to try to get rich and get gold. Um, you even saw some from the Orient, some from China and Japan coming over. And it created what's called a boom town. Now a boom town is where you have a small village and o o almost overnight this, this city grows into a massive city with over 20,000 people. So you're talking about a city or a town with maybe a hundred people that explodes to over 20,000. That's a huge increase in a very short amount of time. And so that's why they call them boom towns. And they're popping up everywhere. And they're, they're growing to support the growing population that's brought in by the gold rush. The gold at this time was doubling the size of the world's gold supply. So all the gold from all over the world, so much gold came out of the California gold rush that it doubled the supply uh, of, of the gold coming out of the world. But here's a problem. Only a very few people got rich from this. Most people, the vast majority of people that went to California to get rich did not. The only people that did get rich were the people that were selling stuff to these people trying to get rich. So the people selling uh, pitchforks, the people selling shovels and pans and clothes and food and, and housing. These people were getting rich. Everybody else really wasn't finding, they weren't finding that much gold. And, and mainly because they weren't able to really truly mine, they were only able to get the gold that was sitting at the top in the rivers. Those are the only people that were able to get gold because they didn't know how to mine. These are doctors and lawyers and farmers and teachers and just regular people. They don't know about mining. 
The only thing they can do is get a pan, st stick it in the water, grab up some dirt, slosh it around, and hopefully find a few nuggets of gold. Well, that's not going to make you rich. You might get a little money in your pocket, but definitely not rich. But one person that did get rich that, that you guys might know about is a guy named Levi Strauss. See, these pants that people are wearing at the time, you know, they're made of cotton or wool or, or what have you, um, but they're not durable. <laughs> you know, they're not durable. They're more like dress pants. And so he came up with an idea that he was going to use this fabric called denim to make pants that would withstand this, all this wear and tear of the gold rush. And, uh, and he did. And so you can see here a picture of Levi Strauss. Uh, you can see kind of an advertisement for his, his full body overalls that would help, you know, keep you clean, basically not ruin your clothes underneath and, uh, and be able to withstand the wear and tear so you don't get your shirts all dirty and ripped up. Um, and then here's what, you know, a pair of pants would look like all dirty and, and everything. At the end of the day, that's what you'd comb home looking like all just ripped up, but it would stand it and it would take patches. You could patch it up if it did rip. Uh, but the gold rush had a long lasting impact on California, the face of California on its agriculture, right? Cause these people come, they're going to need to be fed. So you need to plant crops to support them. So crops started to become a, a big deal. Shipping, you know, shipping supplies in and out to support the gold rush trade again, supporting the gold rush. So the gold rush, impacted single-handedly changed the face of California as people knew it at the time. Another thing that you started seeing is because California wasn't an official state yet, you started seeing people creating their own laws, taking law into their own hands. It was called vigilante law. Vigilante law. And vigilante law is this. It's where you know, you do take law into your own hands. And so if somebody does you wrong or you feel like they did you wrong, you just take care of it yourself. You don't call the police. You just take care of it. Well, that creates chaos. And you know, I was in class and we talked about it like this. I said, what if we took all of seventh and eighth grade, put them in the auditorium, and then every adult went home? And the kids in the, in the class said, oh, you, you'd come back and it'd be bloody. We'd be begging you to come back. Well, that's what it probably would have been like. Uh, it wasn't a great place, but... Uh, but very soon there was a need to bring structure and the U.S. brought California into the Union, made it an official state in 1850, five years after Texas became a state. Texas became a slave state, but California is admitted into the Union as a free state. So there's a little bit of balance there. A little bit of balance there. Okay. That's pretty much it, guys. We're going to... Uh, there's another video on the gold rush that we watched you can feel free to look it up on youtube we're not going to look at it here uh, but we did talk about you know was this a good period in american history this gold rush it was it good was it bad it could go either way but uh get get the worksheets get the graphic novel and the questions uh, that was homework and then the vocabulary worksheet was done in class it's supposed to be due at the end of class so make sure you have both of those make sure that you put your bell work with that and that we have that for you so that I can put it in your grade book. Otherwise, guys, have a good time. Have a good night. Uh, if you have any questions, always, uh, obviously I'm always available for you. So thank you.